going to um, record this session, so later we'll be able to post it on the uh, internet as well. So let's talk about automating Soxlet extractions. When you normally think about automate, or when you think about fat extraction, a lot of times you, the immediate idea or thought that comes to your mind is oil seeds, canola, rapeseed, soybean, palm kernel, things like that. But quite frankly, the fat extraction is used across industries. We have users in both um, uh, human foods, uh, large, large quantity of users in the meat industries in, in particular. Uh, of course, oil seeds, animal feeds, pet foods, things like that. So it's a very broad application. And when most people are thinking about fat extraction, they're thinking about some form of Soxlet extraction. Uh, Soxlet extraction is uh, a low temperature extraction. In other words, uh, it is because it is a glass system, it is an open system, uh, you can only take the solvent to its boiling point. And typically, when you think of pet ether, you're talking about 45, 50 degrees. Hexane's a little bit higher. Again, different solvents have different um, boiling points. Uh, but typically, we're talking about a low temperature uh, um, extraction. Typically, there are four to six hours, excuse me, two to six hours. But quite frankly, we're aware of users that were telling us that they were doing eight and even 16 hour extractions with certain sample types. So it can be a, a very time consuming extraction. And although it does, um, by, by its very definition as a Soxlet, it does have that recycling capability. Generally speaking, it's very poor recycling. Uh, one, because it requires some manual labor in order to make it happen. It's each tube is individually handled. So I talk to more uh, users than not that when they're using a, if you will, a conventional Soxlet, they're, they're not recycling at all because of the time consumption that's involved. Um, the, the method itself can be li very labor intensive, largely because each one is handled individually. Now, I, I realize there's, there's other systems out there, Sox Tech, things like that, Sox Therm, but they still are all handled individually. And in those cases, usually um, six per system. Uh, if you're just doing Soxlet glassware yourself, obviously you can have it set up any way you want, as many as you want. I've actually been into uh, laboratories where they've had an entire room dedicated to just Soxlet extractions and probably had 60 Soxlet um, glassware setups within, their, within that one room, huge uh, uh, hooded room, if you will. Um, one of the things that we, we talk about, and this is more sample dependent when we're talking about Soxlet, but uh, that is the risk of oxidizing fat um, because of the way the oil is treated both during the process, again, if you're talking a two to four hour extraction or two to six or eight or 16, as we mentioned, um, you have the oil um, on the heat for a long period of time. And at the end, and Brian is going to talk a little bit about this from some tests that he did, but at the end, you also have uh, the treatment of the oil as your, um, if you will, um, fuming off or drying off the, the residual solvent that's in there as well as moisture. So Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about your studies relative to the oxidation issue? Sure. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> this sheet does give us a, an, an, you'll see that there are six different treatments. And, and once again, as I mentioned before, this was done with a corn sample. Uh, in each case, again, the, the extractions were five hours. Uh, steps, or, or I should say samples three, four, five, and six were done for straight five hours, no other adaptations, where one and two, we, we split the, uh, the extraction time. Uh, with number one, we, we, we did a one and a half hour extraction and then took that solvent away, added a fresh solvent for three and a half more hours. And with number two, we, we, we did the same thing, just a different, different time frame three hours for the first extraction and two hours for the second extraction. The key really for us is what we saw was the evaporation of the solvents. Uh, in, in the case of the first four uh, treatments, the first four samples, we used a steam bath and in numbers one, two, and three, we involved on the steam bath a nitrogen blanket where with number four, we did not use the nitrogen. Of course, the nitrogen blanket would eliminate the, the oxygen that would be available to the sample for oxidation. And Brian, that was just a slow flow of nitrogen over the top of each of the uh, beakers, if I recall correctly. Exactly, exactly right. And then uh, for five and six, we used a heat plate 
Uh, for five, we used a low, low heat heat plate. And for number six, we used a high heat heating plate. And you can see quite a difference with uh, between one to four and five, how much higher the fat result was uh, because of the oxidation. However, and the question has to be asked, uh, if, if you used a uh, high heat heat plate with number six, why did you not, not get that high fat value? And it seemed that the, the, the high, with the high heat, the fat was volatilized. And we actually, as you can see, we actually had a lower fat value with that than we did with the, uh, with the, with the lower heat heating plate. But you'll notice that every time we changed something to make the, the, uh, the extraction and the, the follow-on as far as the uh, evaporation of solvents, every time we made it a little more stringent, a little less uh, uh, insulated, shall we say, uh, we, you notice that the fat did increase until finally we, we volatilized that fat in step number six. Yeah, so it's the high heat the damage is, is bottom line. Is what high happened. heat and, and the, the availability of oxy, oxygen to the sample. Right. Yeah. Now, let, and again, I, and I'm, I hope I'm not saying something twice here, but I just want to make sure that we do clarify um, the, the, what you're seeing here, the uh, diagonal line bars, that's the direct, which basically means that we're weighing the oil. So we do the extraction, actually weigh the oil. That's a typical Soxlet type of uh, extraction. The indirect method, which is also approved, uh, AOAC approved method, is the weighing the loss of oil. Um, and so obviously when you're weighing the loss of the oil, you're not weighing the oil itself, you're weighing the sample after the, the, the oil is gone or the fat is gone. And so that's why there's no oxidation issue because we're not, we're not doing anything with the oil at the end. So that's just a point of clarification just in Correct. case people are saying, IG, I've never heard the term uh, direct or indirect relative to um, sock, sock blood extractions. So I, I hope that adds a little bit of uh, clarity if, uh, if necessary. Um, the, the systems that we're talking about when we're talking about automated sock sled are the, the XT10. That was one of our earlier systems. We, we actually introduced fat extraction in the early 2000 uh, period, about 2000, late 2000 actually, uh, with what was called an XT20 extractor. And perhaps there's a number of you that, out there that might have that. We had that one out probably about five or six years. Um, and then we moved. We actually had... XT10, XT20, and XT15 out for a while, but then it became apparent to us that the XT15 um, really uh, took over what the XT20 was doing. The XT20 had a much bigger uh, bench, print, a bench print, if you will, footprint on that, and so we discontinued that one, obviously continued to support it for years after that, but um, now we have the XT10 the XT15, and then we also have a system that does hydrolysis. We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, near the end of the presentation. Um, just to give you some highlights on this, uh, and hopefully you can see my arrow here, this is the XT15. Uh, as you'll see, there's a, a section over here. This is where the solvent is added in the beginning at installation. So you'll add, you know, I, I'll normally add a higher amount of solvent. Uh, uh, again, I don't know if you could see it very well, but um, there is a line at a sight glass, and usually we want you to fill it up at least to that amount, which is about 550, 575 milliliters of solvent. I'll normally put in about 675, and I'll take it up higher. That just means, on the sight glass here, that just means that it's less times, um, it's a longer period of time before I have to uh, top off the solvent. Um, if you've got good chilled water running through the system, um, I would say below 15 C, um, you're talking about recycling or recovery of your solvent at the 97 percentile or even better, which means ultimately, since you can run 15 samples at a time, that you're using less than a milliliter of solvent per sample. Uh, this is a closed system, which basically means that the solvent is added with the vessel, which is right down here, closed, and so you can run uh, one extraction right after another. The XT10 to the left you see it's got a glass port here. It too recycles solvent, but it um, puts it into that um, container, and then you manually will add that for your next run, which means you need to um, wait for the, the vessel, this portion down here, to cool down. 
um, before you can put the, the solvent in. So that could be 20 to 30 minutes. So you get less volume per day. Um, I have personally, and, and there's a kind of a story behind this, but uh, we can address that later, I suppose. I have personally done 150 extractions in a day with the, um, with the XT15. And I guess I will allude a little bit into that because I, I should emphasize that one of the differences between the direct method, in other words, where you're weighing the oil, and the indirect method, is that the direct method, you actually are drying off the solvent and moisture at the end of the process. With our system, because we're weighing the loss of oil, we need to make sure that we're not calling moisture oil. So therefore, we pre-dry the samples before they go into the system. And by simply um, uh, weighing the filter bag, including the weight of the filter bag, you can actually get a moisture value as well as your fat value with the samples you're testing. Um, so that's normally a three-hour uh, pre-dry period. In some samples, it might be less. Um, it also depends on your ovens. Uh, basically, we're talking 100, and, 100 to 105 degrees pre-dry temperature. Um, there's different things you do if you're using, for instance, the very high fat. There's different things that we can you know, get into later as needed. Or, again, I'm going to direct you to a, a full operational video that explains a lot of this as well that you can look at at your leisure. So, um, uh, you know, so the pre-drying, so what I did in the case where I did 150 is the night before I actually had set three or four full sets already either fully pre-dried or almost fully pre-dried. Then when I came in in the morning at, I believe it was 8 o'clock, um, I had samples th that could immediately go into the system. And while those samples were extracting, I was preparing more samples to be pre-dried, and that's why I was able to run. I actually ran 11 runs of 15 in that day based on that. That's the full disclosure on how, how, and how that works. So XT10. XT15 and hydrolysis. We're going to talk a little bit about that. That's the system that like allows you to do a hydrolysis prior to extraction, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the analytical principle because I, if I hadn't said it already, um, well, people every once in a while will say to us, "Well, how does this compare to a Soxlet?" And the statement we make, the thing we try to emphasize, is this is a Soxlet. It works the exact same way as a Soxlet in that the solvent goes into the vessel. I'm going to go back to that original picture um, of the instrument just so I can point out some things. And so here I'm at the XT15. Again, hopefully you can see my arrow here. We've added the solvent up here. When we, we follow the controller that tells us, you know, the temperature we want, the, in, in the case of the newest program, you actually say what solvent you're using, hexane, petroleum ether, diethyl ether. That way it has presets in for some temperatures. Uh, you select the time you want, how long to extract. I am not aware, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of any samples that we have done that have taken more than an hour for extraction. No, that hour is what we, we set our, Typically is our, our default. Uh, instrument in the lab always for right. one hour. And, and that's because, because we obviously know some samples will be a lot quicker than that, but we just, just we have one method and we just keep doing that's that. That's correct. Once the oil is extracted, nothing more will be extracted. So if, if the full extraction is done in 40 minutes, then that extra 20 minutes hurts nothing. Right. Uh, but it, it does ensure that we will get the oil out of each sample every time we run it. And actually, one of the things I like about the, the filter bag system and how this works is that you can run 15 samples at a time. You don't have to run 15. You're still going to, because of the recycling, you're still not going to use any more solvent than before. But you run 15 samples. And so you could have some samples that maybe only take 20 minutes, and some samples that take 45 minutes, and some samples that take an hour and you're going to be able to run them all together. You don't have to segregate, oh, this is a lower, you know. Correct. And, and also people ask us, can we run our low fats with our high fats? And the answer, of course, is yes. Any, any sample can be run whether, whether it has low, low amount of oil, high amount of oil, middle. Uh, that, that's not important either. Right. And what's also is if you ever have a sample that you run, and at the end you say, oh, I, I don't know if this number is correct. I think the number is low. You can actually, without having to re-prepare a sample, you can actually put that sample right back into the XT15. This is after you've dried and weighed it. You can put it back in, extract it for a longer period of time, and then basically look to see if the number has changed. Correct. If the number has gone up, it hasn't plateaued, then you know, oh, this one took a longer, needed a longer extraction time. Correct. So that's kind of neat about that. But basically, to back to that um, slide showing the principle, all the solvent goes into the bottom here. Um, as it volatilizes, it hits a condenser. That's where your cooling water is important. 
Um, a lot of laboratories, just because they don't want to have to run water down the drain, use chillers, but you don't have to use a chiller. You can run it through your tap, just like uh, you do. many do with a Soxlet. It uh, just means that you're you know, constantly putting water down the drain, and if it's a cost issue, um, it's, a, it's easier to do a chiller, and I think in the long run it might pay off, but that's, that's your call, obviously. Um, the key for us is we don't want the water, I believe um, we basically say we want to definitely be below 23 degrees C for your cooling water, ideally the cooler the better. 15. 15 is the yeah, ideal. That yeah. would be the ideal. Yeah. Yeah. I think when we run chillers, I think we run them at like 10 degrees, and we have a, 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 a glycerol, a glycol um, mixture, 50-50, yes. I believe. So that's, that's what this is. It, it, it about two to three minutes uh, of exchange. So one thing I didn't uh, illustrate is the vessel is this portion here. That's the steel vessel. Inside it, we have what we call a Teflon insert. That's where the samples and the filter bags go. And so as the um, gases volatilize and hit the condenser, they fill this Teflon insert exposing the samples to the, the, the solvent, uh, be it hexane or petroleum ether or diethyl ether, or we've even had some customers use chloroform. We don't like that, but we do have some customers using chloroform. Um, and then when it gets to the top, it reaches its siphon point and dumps down. There it is, just like the Soxlet. Um, and it's about two to three minutes at 90 degrees, it's about two to three minutes of exchange. So you're talking about 30 exchanges in a, in a 30 minute or 60 minute period yes. if you do that. Um, and then, as I said, what's, what's beautiful about this, it is a closed system. So imagine, if you will, if you're, whether you're at 90 degrees or 105 degrees, the, there is pressure in here. Uh, Brian, I know it varies by solvent. I think petroleum ether is usually in the 45 to 50. About 45. To 50, uh, or 45, ether, okay. Ethyl ether is a little higher, about 60. Okay, so, the, and chloroform, if I recall, that's the one that really gets in much, like gets 65 or something. We've done it so little, I really don't know right, okay. right now, but uh, I think it may I be think that higher. was a higher pressure one. Um, so at the end of the process, basically the system opens a valve, and so you've got that pressure wanting to go somewhere, and that's what, um, if you will, for lack of a better term, vacuums up the, the solution. So at the end of the run, in the bottom of this vessel, you'll have your oil, which by the way, it's a mixture of all the oil from the, the 15 samples, and trace amounts of, of uh, solvent. It does a very uh, aggressive uh, recycling of the solvent. And Brian, I, I might be jumping ahead on this a little bit, but it's probably a good point to mention that early on, especially early on, we did a lot of um, studies where we actually, and I believe we did it by chromatography, uh, where we looked at the, um, uh, the, re the distilled recycled solvent, and we looked at to see if any of the peaks changed, and I know we did at least 10 different uh, cycles of that and never saw peaks change. No, that's true, and that's that's whether it's a single solvent or we'll talk in a few minutes about a, a mixture of solvents uh, that that one could use. Yeah. So that's 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 the principle. Um, so Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about our high temperature and some of the examples we've had with different solvents. Well, we have talked briefly of the fact that uh, the higher temperature does improve the extraction kinetics. It allows the the solvent to penetrate the cell more easily uh, to re remove the fat molecule. Um, the, the nice thing about it, and, and again we mentioned this briefly, that once the oil has been extracted, the other components are not affected. Uh, and, and every solvent has a little bit different polarity so that each solvent will define uh, the analyte. Each solvent will define what can be removed from each sample. Um, and of course, it does, uh, as, as it indicated there, it does indeed improve the, the penetration. Uh, this is a chart right here. It actually shows three different solvents. You, if you look down at the very bottom, you'll notice that the PE, petroleum ether, and the hexane averages are really quite close, where the EE, which is ethyl ether, or diethyl ether, as, as it's commonly referred to in some places, uh, is quite a bit higher in the extraction for those same nine samples. And, and, and again, it goes back to the polarity. The polarity index for hexane and pet ether is 0 0.1, where the polarity index for diethyl ether, or again, ethyl ether, is 2.8. So we have really quite a difference there. And you'll see with some samples, uh, it doesn't make an awful lot of difference in the actual fat value, where with others, it's, it's somewhat more dramatic.
And if, if I recall, Brian, the um, basically what we're doing, because we're the, the, the key is now some people say, well, wait a second, are you drawing something else out? No, we're still looking at polarity, if you will, a nonpolar solvent. And so that's bringing out the nonpolar components, which are lipids. Um, as polarity increases slightly, and uh, you know we're looking at a 2.8, as Brian said, for the ethyl ether, um, compared to, for instance, an ethanol, which is also a solvent that's used. We're, we'll talk a little bit about that. That's got a, a, an index of 25, so it's much more polar than um, than uh, even ethyl ether. So, uh, whereas, uh, for instance, something like an ethanol, or at least a, if you have a percentage of ethanol in your system, again, when we talk about majanya, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you're, you're drawing phospholipid sterols and other types of, of uh, lipid components that aren't necessarily drawn by the, the, the PET ether or the hexane. And so that's, that's kind of important to recognize um, that it's still lipids, but slight changes in polarity can affect what is drawn off. Uh, again, most of you are, are you know, students of, of chemistry and things like that, so uh, I'm, uh, don't, I'm not uh, talking down, I hope. Um, the, when people ask me about uh, this, one of the best illustrations I can always think of is if you think about, you know, when I was a kid, when you really didn't like somebody uh, and you had a real problem, you might put uh, sugar in their gas tank. It, it, obviously, you were not a very nice person if you did that, but um, the petroleum in a car um, uh, could not um, uh, dissolve the sugar, and so it would gum up an engine, and it, uh, please don't do that to anybody. That's not a suggestion. Um, uh, whereas, you know, water is a very polar, uh, it's got, uh, it's a covalent bond in, in water, and that will dissolve things like uh, salt and uh, sugar and such. Um, so it's, it, it's polarity makes a difference. So you could not, you would not dissolve sugar in petroleum ether, for instance, um, just to give you a kind of an illustration. So Brian, I, I took a little of your thunder there. Why don't you talk a little bit about some of the results? Well, this, this page right here is uh, in preparation for our, our collaborative study that we did for the official method. Uh, we did the conventional method. Actually, we had a goldfish, and then also we did uh, the, the same samples using our uh, extractor. Uh, and in, in this case, you'll see that we went from uh, less than 1% of oil in the rice hulls down to uh, the cheese curls. Uh, which up to. Well, that's true. That's true. Up to, uh, as far as fat content, up to 43.2% uh, uh, cheese curls. And uh, to go even further, one of our check samples we have is a high fat check sample that we do make available to customers, uh, which has 99.5% oil. So the oil content is not important. Again, it's the solvent uh, that's removing the oil from the sample that will make in some cases dramatic, in other cases very small differences. But you can see quite a range there of different samples that we had uh, available for our collaborative study. And you can basically, I, what you kind of just alluded to is, you know, if, if you can do it in a sock slot, you can do it in, in our system. Absolutely. It's, um, I think I've shared with you before, I was at a, one of our large meat customers um, that has our XT15 extraction, and they actually wanted to see, can we do meat rendering? which was basically just a oil. And uh, I, if my recollection is right, it was like 98 point something percent fat because it did have impurities in it that, that added to it. But I mean, it was basically like pouring oil into the bag. We do have some uh, unique handling um, uh, uh, actions when it comes to high fat samples like that. But uh, basically, you know, we can, we can do it. That's, that's the key point. Yes. Not a problem at all. And then, Brian, there was a regression done as part of the, the, the statistical analysis yes, that was done for the approval. This is the regression chart here. And you can see the, the R squared is, uh, is excellent. Uh, and down in the bottom right-hand corner, the approval method for the AOCS uh, approved method uh, using our instrumentation, AM5-04. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, the certified labs that we sent the samples to and then the collaborative data from 11 or 12 different samples, uh, excuse me, 11 or 12 yeah. different labs internationally as well as domestically. And, and one thing we should point out, this is also available on our website, www.ancom, A-N-K-O-M.com. Um, that has the methods, the published methods 
on it in, under analytical procedures. And um, in that is the, the, the statistical data that shows how many labs participated in each sample. Everything was done in double blind, um, or blind duplicates, I should maybe say uh, more uh, correctly. Um, there was three referee labs that ran either AOAC or AOCS uh, methods, depending on the sample. Some samples required uh, certain uh, methods. And uh, so in that statistical analysis, you can basically see the equivalence between, as you said, the 11 or 12, because there are some cases where a, a lab wouldn't work with a certain sample. They, you know, they were a forage lab, and so they wouldn't do our meat study samples, for example. And so, um, you know, that, that'll show you. You'll see how many labs participated in the samples, what the results were from those. You'll see RSDs. You'll see all the, the data on that statistical analysis, which basically showed us equivalent for a broad range of samples. We did what? We did forages. We did oil seeds. We did human foods. We did meats. And we did meats. Yes. So we did those four different categories because we wanted to basically show the, the robustness, if you will, of the system. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an understanding of the crude fat side of that. But there's also this idea of hydrolysis, which we've alluded to, and obviously many of you are aware of it and probably are doing it. Um, hydrolysis is maybe in its simplest uh, form is to say bound fat. So if the sample is protein bound, or in this case it talks about glyco and lipoprotein bond, um, bound fat, uh, it is not going to be readily available to a solvent extraction. We, we use um, a, perhaps a simplified term of saying you've got complex or bound fat and you've got free fat. Free fat is that which is going to be removed by a, a SOX letter, or a, if you will, a solvent extraction. Bound fat requires that the, the, the bonds be broken in order to make the, the fat uh, or oil available. And that's where I was talking about our hydrolysis system. Um, it is a very uh, simple system. Uh, I don't want to overstate it. As you can see, again, I've got my arrow pointing at it. Uh, this is Teflon, just like the Teflon insert that we use for the XT10 and XT15. Obviously, this is a larger vessel. Um, it is a it got computer controls on it, but basically what happens is you open this lid here, and you're able to insert up to 15 samples. That makes it compatible with the XT10 and XT15. You manually add your um, hydrochloric acid. That's the, largely the, the hydrolysis solvent of choice, normally a 3 to 4 um, molar um, uh, hydrochloric acid. That's what um, breaks the bonds. Then after it does that, after it does that in that vessel, uh, usually it will do 90 degrees for 60 minutes. Um, and after that, the system will drain the hydrochloric acid out and do a series of rinses. The system allows you to select how much time you want to do in rinses. I think the way we've got the program now is, is it, isn't even go so far now to say how many rinses and then the timing, or is it still just showing a time? No, I believe it's, it's still time. Just the time, okay. So usually the default is 20 minutes. Correct, and that's what all our studies were done based on 20 minute rinses. That does not remove all the acid from the sample. Uh, that's why we, in with the system, ships a, a small oven, if you will, that can fit under your uh, appropriate vent hood. And so as any acid volatilizes during the drying process, it's captured by a zinc impregnated charcoal filter. Um, and then at the end of that, all the acid is gone from it. And I think yeah. it's a fairly small amount of acid at that point, but it, it basically that's what eliminates all the acid. Um, but, you know, certainly people, if they want to check put 60 minutes of rinses they can. The, the, our, our studies have basically shown it does not do that much to re, remove not the, the not acid. Not that much more. No, Correct. Because no, yeah. it's, very Cause it's a fairly way. gentle process. We're not trying to force water through it with pressure because, quite frankly, we don't want to remove any oil at this stage. In this case, we want to maintain the oil, although in its uncomplex state, so then it can go directly from there after drying. It goes directly to a, the XT10, XT15 for the final extraction. Correct. So, Brian, let's talk a little bit about some differences between non-hydrolysis and hydrolysis. Well, largely there are, are two sample types uh, that, that are, if, if you would call, big for hydrolysis. Uh, in this case, uh, you see a lot of pet foods and most, most of these uh, particular samples on this sheet. They've been, they've been uh, 
uh, heated to a very high uh, temperature for the extrusion a relative, process that they let them go through and exactly like and for for quite a, quite a long time frame so if you look at the uh, the two colors the light yellow is a crude fat extraction that was done on all of the samples and then the orange or darker yellow is the hydrolysis fat uh, value that was gained with those samples so you can see quite a quite a big difference uh, with with some of the samples on the other hand, if you look about uh, three quarters of the way to the right on that chart, there's a feed stuff cat for, for cattle, which doesn't show quite as drastic a difference. And, and we would expect a much smaller difference for that type of sample than we would for the uh, pet foods that, that make up the majority of the rest of this chart. And, and Brian, this is actually a, uh, maybe a good time to you know, you had alluded to in the, the earlier um, slide, you talked about the the increased penetration, and that may not be the best way for us to word it, but the because of the the higher temperature, again, we're not and we're not talking super critical by any means. We're talking about 90 to 105 degree temperatures are uh, the selection ranges that we have, and we default to 90 degrees. Um, but um, we have examples. Uh, we have one in the pet food industry in which they found that a, a number, not all, but a number of their dog food samples, if I recall correctly, they found out they didn't have to hydrolyze when they used our crude fat because, I don't know if this is the best way to say it, but it, the, some of the samples were not highly complexed. And so there was enough penetration with the solvent at the 90 degrees in order to remove that. And so they were getting the kind of results they would have expected with their normal hydrolysis process. That, that is possible uh, and not not as likely as we'd like to think right right, right. yeah it's not yeah I would not want to make it as a blanket statement I just right. I know that that example and I also know that we had a have a, um, a customer that's in the uh, the chocolate industry mm. and uh, yes. they matter of fact ended up not getting hydrolysis they just went the XT15 because they found that the results that they were getting were consistent with what they would expect for those types of samples. Yes. Admittedly, we have another couple of chocolate companies that they hydrolyze everything because they're using liqueurs and things like that that just require that further breakdown. Correct. Yeah. Correct. The uh, the next chart will show the another type of sample that requires hydrolysis, and that is uh, dairy products, um, the milks, the cottage cheeses, and so on. And uh, you can see here. Uh, an equivalence. Um, basically, the expected value is the green, uh, and while where our values that we gained in testing here in our lab were the red numbers. Uh, a, a key here is that actually with with the pet foods that we saw on the last chart and the dairy products that we saw here in the U.S. and uh, I believe also in Canada and Mexico, much of North America, the Mojanye or Mojanya or however however you wish to pronounce it. We say Mojo uh, for short. <laughs> mojo for short. Yes, uh, it tends to be the the method of choice, if you will. Uh, so that requires a, a mixture of three solvents. We, we alluded to this earlier: forty five percent petroleum ether, forty five percent ethyl ether, and ten percent ethanol. Let, let's 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 stop here. Just for those of you that are not familiar with the, uh, the Mojanya method. Um, it is a biphasic method in which you would do the hydrolysis in, in a specially made, um, I don't know what you would call it, glassware, it's a majanya tube or whatever, I think that's what they would normally call it. Um, and then, then they would go through a series of extractions of that biphasic process by first doing it with a petroleum ether. Petroleum, petroleum ether, ether. They'll do it. They'll basically shake it um, by, if you will, holding with a stopper and then raising the, the flask up to their shoulders and back and forth. So it's an up and down motion. It's an aggressive shaking. Aggressive shaking. And then it goes to a centrifuge. They centrifuge it. Well, well then you would use the diethyl ether all. So you have the pet Don't you centrifuge first. between each one? No. You do not. Okay. Yeah. Pet ether first, then the diethyl ether. And then the ethanol. Uh, then then you would centrifuge to separate the two phases. And then do you do the ethanol after that, or was the ethanol? Oh, no, the ethanol actually was placed is placed prior to everything. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you could show you could see I'm not as familiar with the Majanya method as I thought I was. But but the but the bottom line is you're pouring off the, the of the biphase. You're pouring off the oil, the solvent, uh, and so it's it can be somewhat of a tedious method. So 
we are replicating that by doing the hydrolysis and now we're using a mixed solvent. So we're not doing three individual or four individual steps. It's hydrolysis followed by an extraction with the solvents mixed in the exact same proportion as the um, uh, Majanya method we require, which is, as you said, 45%, 45%, 10%. Correct, correct. And, and the nice thing, and, and again, that would, that would be true of certainly these samples that we see here, the more, more dairy samples than were in the last chart, uh, the pet foods. Again, in North America, we would, we would expect to see more of a Majanya method and more of Majanya numbers. Uh, in the rest of the world, particularly Europe, uh, hydrolysis is followed mostly by petroleum ether. And again, in many other countries, uh, that, that is true. So we would always expect a little bit higher value as we go back to that original chart where we saw the ethyl ether out, if you will, out extracting the single uh, hexane or petroleum ether. Uh, so that's, uh, that shows you a little bit about the equivalence that we would expect from these type of samples by using our method. And, and, and what you're, again, I just want to make sure we're clarifying for the, I don't know if it's true for the dog food sample, but for all the dairy samples, that was Majanya. Correct. Was the dog food used the Majanya yeah, yes. sample? That was yeah, used the dog food. Okay. Case. That was used um, there. And so that 10% that of that ethanol, remember, it has a higher polarity index. So if a sample, and that's where milk issues come up uh, or dairy issues come up when you're talking about more sterols and phospholipids, uh, that's what's going to give that slightly higher number than just a standalone or straight hydrolysis without the mixed solids. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of maybe a broad picture of both our crude fat and our hydrolysis fat, recognizing that hydrolysis is used in conjunction with the, the, the solvent extraction systems that, that we have. Um, we want to make sure we some, take some time to answer questions. I also want to point to you, bear with me as I um, try to do something here. Let's see if we don't have a system issue again. If you want to at some time, um, and hopefully everyone now can still see, now you should see the ANCOM website, www.ancom.com up here. On that website, if you go to the section that says news, and then in that you go to a, a section that says web links, I actually just put this up today, in the web links section you'll see a link to our YouTube videos, and there's videos, everything from case studies to customers' comments, all the way down to, where is it here? Here it is, the XT15 crude, exact, crude fat procedure that walks you through everything from how you prepare the samples, dry them, handle them, everything. So as you can see, that's just under 16 minute uh, video. And there's videos on lots of our other products as well as uh, technical service things in here as well. So I would just encourage you when you have an opportunity and a desire uh, to go ahead and, and check that out um, and it might answer a lot of questions for you. So that concludes the presentation part of it. I've been kind of watching the, um, the chat box, if anybody had any questions that they could write down in the chat. But I'm also going to, uh, on my side, I've unmuted any microphones that, that you don't have muted. If you have a microphone that's muted and you want to speak out, please do that. You can unmute your microphone. We can hear you. Or... Um, and sometimes this is a little less confusing, you can put your questions down in the chat line. So again, we want to make sure we give anybody an opportunity to ask questions. And did, did we put them all asleep? Either we put you all asleep or it's been so wonderful you have all your answers. Well, uh, I'll, I'll just do a little bit of closing here. Again, if you want to write down a question in there, please feel free to do that. Uh, we will follow up uh, after this with a survey. We're always looking for ways to improve. And I realize, of course, in the beginning we had a, a, a technical problem. Hopefully that won't happen again. But um, we will be sending out a survey for you. And, and a question has come in. Uh, this question says, can you give me an estimated time of analysis start to finish for total fat? So when you use the word total fat, that immediately says to us hydrolysis fat. So Brian, why don't you give us... A well, it's about an hour and 20 minutes altogether for the hydrolysis. Uh, one hour, an hour for the hydrolysis uh, samples soaking in the acid, and then 20 minutes of rinses. So we have an hour and 20 minutes there. 
uh, then we, what we normally would do, as Chris indicated before, the acid is not completely gone from the samples. So we take about five or ten minutes to blot the samples in paper towel to, to rid the samples of, of uh, probably, uh, I, I'm going to guess about 10% of the acid is still in the bags at that point. And then we blot them and remove probably about 80 to 90% of that acid. And, so, and we actually have a tool that comes with it we call the H35 blotter. That's so I mean right. it basically makes it so everybody's doing it the standard way each time. Correct. So another, let's say, five to ten minutes there. And then we do spend three hours drying the samples at 100 to 105. We found that if uh, we, we've had folks try to dry them, dry them at a much higher temperature for a shorter time, and our concern there is well-founded in that we found that uh, you may be able to bind the fat that you just all, all, over, all over again. <laughs> so so we, we use the mild temperature of 100 to 105 for three hours. So now we have, let's say, four and a half hours that, that are total. Uh, we do uh, place the samples once they uh, come out of any of our, our drying positions, whether it's our fat, whether it's our fiber, uh, we place them in the desiccant pouch and allow them to cool for about 10 minutes, depending on how many bags there are. And uh, then we would ex uh, weigh them. And then we would do the extraction, which is an hour. And or less. It can be less. Well, that's true. But if our, our default is an hour. Right? Yes. And then uh, uh, we would dry them again for 20 to 30 minutes. So uh, let's see. We had four and a half hours. Uh, let's say it takes us 10 hours to weigh them back. Or, I'm sorry, 10, 10, minutes, 10 <laughs> minutes to weigh them back. So now we're 440, uh, an hour for the extraction, uh, 540. Uh, it, it's going to be a little bit over six hours total time from from start to finish. The nice thing is that there are places where you can now duplicate. For example, once the samples come out of the hydrolysis instrument, you can put another set back in. Um, once the samples are are drying, you can you can extract other samples that may be prepared. Or of course, uh, you may have other work to do within the lab setting. So uh, while it's six, a little over six hour total time, uh, there's not an awful lot of technician time that's taken during that. And, and and we have typically done three runs because what you said, because while one sample is in the dryer, another sam set of samples, 15, is in that. So for us, doing three runs in a day is not an issue. No. So we're, we're looking at 45 extractions that we can do in a day uh, with a system. And as Brian said, you can also be doing crude fat extractions while, while hydrolysis is going on. Again, unless you are running back-to-back -back hydrolysis right to the hydrol or excuse me, from hydrolysis to the XD15. Obviously, you're tying up the XD15 at that time. But, um, yeah, 45 in a day is, is typical. So long process, but for uh, 45 samples, three runs in a day is, is typical. So we gave you a, probably a more detailed answer than you want, but that's basically, <laughs> that gives you it. All right, I don't see any other questions. Now, you, most of you, well, all of you should have my email um, because I sent you out the notices and the reminders. So please feel free to send us any um, additional questions you might have. I hope you have a chance to look at that video that I linked, showed you. Uh, we have or are recording this presentation right now, and we will also make that available on that uh, our YouTube channel as well. So uh, Chris, with that, before you go, uh, Chris, before you go, there is one more question down there from Gloria. Okay. And you might, you might not be able to see it. Oh, there. I didn't. You're right. They ask why we use the diatomaceous earth to prepare these samples. And I'm assuming that she's referring to the hydrolysis samples. So you don't use DE for the regular fat samples. Correct. That's a, that's a very good question. Thank you for answering it. Is, it is a, um, a, an addition that we use in hydrolysis, uh, Brian can go a little bit more into it, but in the short form, um, during hydrolysis, we do not want fat to leach out of the bags. We want to retain the fat during the hydrolysis process. So by using a ratio of diatomaceous earth to sample, we're able to, uh, I don't know if you could say okay. retain or absorb the oil when, it is, when the bonds are broken. And so we don't lose oil during the hydrolysis process. So that way it's readily available for the uh, solvent extraction. Brian, would you yeah, add the, Well, the thing to keep in mind is the extraction, or excuse me, the hydrolysis is performed at 90 degrees. And at 90 degrees, you may have samples that do have low melting point fats that begin to melt, uh, so they'll liquefy. And if we don't 
uh, have a way to absorb those uh, fats than they can uh, and, and sometimes do leach from the bags. So uh, we found that diatomaceous earth does a very good job. It, it does not uh, create a lot of uh, other problems within the system as far as uh, a high blank value and, and so on. So uh, it works out very well for us. So if you had a, if you had a sample uh, that had a lot of uh, low melting point fats, like for example, let's let's say a whipping cream uh, versus a, a two percent milk, uh, the very large difference in the amount of oil that would be available during the hydrolysis to liquefy and and to give us problems. So uh, using the diatomaceous earth that uh, allows us to maintain that oil in the bags so that it is available during the extraction process. But diatomaceous earth is not part of the regular solvent extraction. A lot of methods do mix samples with sand or diatomaceous earth. That's not necessarily in, in our solvent extraction, XT10 or XT15. There isn't... That is, if I could just, just for a second, that is true. Uh, however, some people have asked us, well, how then would I do a crude fat or free fat extraction on liquid samples? And with liquid samples, uh, we would use diatomaceous earth simply to absorb the sample so that we were able to seal the bag. Correct. Uh, otherwise, Chris is exactly correct. And there's actually a process. It's, it's you know, it's probably more to get into now, but I have actually done, as you know, I've done uh, liquid extractions without diatomaceous earth. It just means I had to manipulate the sealer so I was not tipping over the sample exactly. with doing it. So exactly. it, it can be done that way, too. Another question that just came up is about the pre-drying step, and the question it says the pre-drying step is also required, and and the answer is is yes. Um, I I, I want to the, the the main answer is yes. It for our our crude fat, not for hydrolysis, because you're going to no, do hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, you're right. going to do a drying, but it's between. So you Correct. do you're doing hydrolysis, then dry, then extraction. So in that sense, it's a pre-dry before the solvent portion of it, but. Remember, the reason we're doing the pre-dry is because we do not want to call moisture oil at the end of the day, or at the end of the extraction, maybe it would be a better way to put that. Um, and so that's why we do the pre-drying. It's not always three hours, that's just three hours is what we find consistently with every sample that we have done. Um, we do have some customers with some types of samples, and this is largely a meat statement, where they have increased the temperature of the drying, I believe 125 degrees, and I believe they're doing an hour and a half extraction, and they did the testing to confirm that that re removed the moisture from, again, it was a, this is a meat uh, sample uh, statement. So, um, you know, that does, is a modification that people have done. We have had some samples, we have not personally validated this. We have some people that have developed some microwave um, drying steps to reduce their drying time. We're more concerned about, for lack of a better term, bound water that, that microwaves do have a problem with. Um, we have had the question, and I, I'm sorry for ranting a little bit here, but we have had some people that have said, um, well, wait, I have very low moisture. Can I just back calculate the moisture? If I have 1% moisture, I could just reduce it by 1%. That's a true statement, and that's that's doable. My concern would be each time you do that, you're introducing moisture back into the system during the recycling phase. So, you know, petroleum, ether, hexane, they all have some water in them, but if you keep introducing more and more water, you are going to change the dynamics, the polarity of the solvent, and that's going to have a longer-term effect uh, on you. So that's why the pre-drying step, we just say, hey, weigh the bag. That way you'll get a, a moisture value as well as a fat value with the same sample. And two, we would be concerned with any water solubles that may be extracted because the water was in the in the sample when it was, when the sample was extracted. Okay, and there's a question here: What normality do we recommend for HCl? Most of the methods call for a three to four normal hydrochloric acid. What are we using, Brian? Four? We're we're using three in you? ours. Actually, uh, I, I believe Majani actually calls for closer to six, uh, but uh, we use three normal in our system. And another question is, can you clarify what type of samples need acid hydrolysis? Now that is, you know, as Brian pointed out, um, it's um, heat-treated, further processed samples, extruded samples are normally known for hydrolysis. But you also have to go by what your country, again, uh, we have a lot of international um, users. Some countries require hydrolysis for everything, and admittedly, we look at that and we say, why? 
because some samples just do not have bound fat. But basically, you're looking at any sample that might have a lipoprotein or glycoprotein uh, bonds in it that is basically making it so the fat is not readily available to soxlet extraction. Right. And I believe that's the last question. I appreciate all of you hanging in there. For uh, We've gone a little bit. Uh, um, oh, well, we're just shy of an hour, actually. So we're, we're still within our time frame, so I feel pretty good about that. Um, <laughs> again, we will be sending out a survey. We really would appreciate if you get feedback because we always want to make these um, get better. So help us help us improve. Um, you can always come back to us with any further questions and I hope you get a chance to look at that, uh, that video from a lot more detail on the XT15. But with that, again, I'm just checking to make sure no other questions are sneaking in there. With that, we thank you very much. Our next webinar right now is slated for July. I think it's the 14th. The 14th and that's on sequential analysis. And so we hope any of you are interested in sequential analysis and things like that and can some, some general fiber information. And, and some general fiber as well you'll be throwing in there. So thank you very much for your time, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We, we hope to uh, work with you again.